Hello everybody, this is Tom Kappenman from The 100th Monkey and uh, I'm gonna share some things that I ponder, I'm calling this presentation Things I Ponder. So what I would like to do is uh, show you some of the questions, theories and thoughts of our reality through my own personal experiences and uh, you know Put it out there, see what you guys think. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. Now this is a quote by Albert Einstein and I use this in every one of our radio shows. I think the truth of this, the, oh, this, this quote resonates with me so, so deeply. Uh, so many people just uh, right off the bat, first thing they do is uh, when they hear something that does not completely align with the way they see things, the way they understand the universe, the way they understand life, they uh, it just immediately it's a it's a reactive thing where they their first reaction is to condemn it. Oh bullshit! It's not true. Uh, or uh, you know just the no way. It's a, and it it is it it's really quite uh, it's quite mysterious the way that happens I know that you know you talk to the psychologists and they'll they'll give you a whole string of, of reasons and uh, uh, explain why people do this and how it happens and, and you know, I just find it through the programming that we all receive while we're growing up uh, we have become extremely reactive, uh, you know, instead of, instead of actually uh, uh, keeping that open mind and uh, really considering what uh, other possibilities to the answers that life, uh, to, to the questions that life poses us. So, who is Tom? Now, <laughs> I've had quite an interesting life and I've been on this path now for coming up on uh, uh, I guess I'm I'm mm, I had I can't really pinpoint the official start date of when I started uh, seeking and trying to understand life and what was really going on here but uh, I would say I've been 25 to 26 years uh, when I when things started off for me now I was born on November 2nd, 1961. That happens to be All Souls Day. And uh, I'm not, don't know how many people are familiar with that trinity of days. There's All Hallows Eve, Halloween, All Saints Day, and All Souls Day. Uh, in, the, in Mexico, this, in South America, is known as the Day of the Dead. And there's, there's uh, a ton of different rituals and and celebrations throughout the world that are centered on All Souls Day. Now this being born in this day had its own uh, you know, its own little games that it played with my consciousness and me trying to understand who and what I was. Now when I was born something I mean I started off in this world under extremely interesting and uh, bizarre situation. So my mother went into labor and uh, they had her in the delivery room at the hospital and uh, she'd gone through the, the, you know, this was a, a non-drug type birthing process and she'd gone through uh, her labor, which was, was pretty short if I recall right, uh, but I had begun to come out and I had gotten my head and my shoulders out and uh, mysteriously, for some reason, she just completely stopped having any contractions and just and quit pushing. And so, she, I mean, it just stopped. She was just, she, and she was completely comfortable and she was fine and, and uh, I took my first breath. And this is like 10.40 a.m. Well, the doctors and the nurses that were there in the room assisting with the delivery uh, started taking bets on what who what I was going to be was it, is it a boy or a girl you know, uh, you know 
got to understand this is 61 uh, before uh, everybody knew when they were, you know, four months pregnant what was coming out. Uh, but they were, they were gambling on whether or not I was going to be a boy or a girl. So I hung out there with just my head and shoulders for uh, five minutes before the contractions began again and she finally uh, popped me out. So, and voila, I was a boy. So it's like, what clothes shall I wear in this world? Is am I going to be wearing, wearing the clothes of a man or wearing the clothes of a woman? Now this will, this is going to tie in, tie in later. I'll, I'll tell you another story that, that kind of ties this in, but in kind of a reverse way. Now, One another anomalous thing or a strange event in my life when that that came into my memory when I began to wake up was uh, when I was five five years old and we lived in Phoenix Arizona and I was we were all all me and my my older brother and my younger sister we were outside playing and stuff and mom calls us into the house just furious and she lines all three of us up in in front of her and, and uh, what had happened is some, but something, somehow or another, a whole roll of toilet paper had got strung out all over the bathroom. You know, just uh, the whole roll would just spread through the whole bathroom. And she was furious. She thought for sure one of us kids had gone in there and were playing, you know, having fun, throwing toilet paper all over the place. Uh, well, I knew for a fact that none of us had done it because we, we'd all been outside. And... Uh, so she had us all three lined up and she said, uh, told us that, well, one of you, whoever did it had better fess up or I'm going to spank all three of you. Well, I couldn't quite, I, I, I just did not understand or couldn't comprehend how or why she would want to spank all three of us for something that none of us did. So I spoke up and said, Mom, I did it. I didn't want my brother and sister to get spanked for something they didn't do and so I took the blame. Well, she spanked me and sent me to my room and I threw myself on my bed crying, of course, and no sooner had did I hit the bed than I was floating near the ceiling looking down at my body and I distinctly remember my hands felt like balloons. My hand it was it was amazing sensation. And I thought this was just cooler than cool. So I flew through the roof and I was flying through the skies of Phoenix, Arizona. And I could see the whole city down below me. It was, it was absolutely amazing. It was real. And I flew around for a while and then I knew I had to go back to the house. I, to ha I had to go back to my body. So I flew back to the body and, and as I was... As I was coming close to the house, I was coming down out of the sky, and this is a Saturday afternoon, and I saw people walking on the streets and playing outside and stuff, and, and everybody I saw was completely covered with what, at, at five years old, I called it warts. They were all covered with warts. And uh, now, uh, later, as I would describe it, would be like leprous, uh, just covered with, with, with uh, a disease. And it, this absolutely terrified me. I mean, I was frightened out of my mind. And I went back into my body and, and, uh, and woke up. Now, I went from that day, I went uh, the next, oh, 19 years or so of my life, or 24 years, excuse me, the next 24 years of my life were pretty common and pretty average for, for what happens in the 3D world. You know, I, I finished, I, well, I didn't finish school. I left home at 15, but I, I got my GED and, and uh, I went through them into the military and I did four years in the Air Force and, and, uh, uh, yeah, love life, you know, the, the, as a teenager, I had a great time, you know, I experienced, experimented with some, some, some of the drugs and, and I, I had fun partying and, 
And uh, when I got in the military, uh, you know, I, I met I met a woman and and I got married and then I had a, my first child. You know, the average, the things that people normally do in the third dimensional life, the spiritual or the religious thoughts just never really crossed my mind. Uh, I mean, whenever somebody would bring up that type of thing, my immediate response was uh, religious religion was created to control the masses you know that was just what I what I felt and uh, and that was end of conversation for me well I did uh, once I got out of the, the Air Force and uh, moved to I moved to Southern California and uh, this is when the things started really happening that uh, I couldn't quite explain uh, the uh, coincidences. The, uh, uh, the, the I began to hear uh, when I was laying down, when I'd go to bed, and I was laying there, and, and it was quiet. I would hear things that 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 weren't noises that were being made, you know, outside or in the house in the third dimensional realm. I was hearing things that weren't from this realm. And uh, it wasn't so much voices, but there were very strong, uh, for lack of a better term, vibrations. And uh, the sounds inside my head started to begin, started to appear, and uh, things that things that uh, I knew were wrong, or things that I knew needed to be addressed would pop into my consciousness and I would think of these things and and uh, they, they started boiling to the surface and I the it, it was it, it's it's a little hard to to describe exactly how all this was manifesting but it was it was uh, I started to it's I started to wonder what's really going on I, I mean it wasn't really a passion at this point I was still you know, my still main focus was, you know, making money and and buying things and getting things and doing things, having fun, and you know, that was still my primary focus in life. And I had uh, I had gotten in trouble with the law at one point, and uh, I had been sentenced to go to jail and uh, with the system the way we got it now okay well I went through the courts and everything and they sentenced me and then sent me home and said okay report to jail in three months <laughs> it was kind of weird but anyway so in this three month period I had I'd moved from San Bernardino to Palm Springs and I was still building houses. I, by the way, I was a, a carpenter for, well, I was a carpenter for 20 years before I changed jobs to doing what I'm doing now. But uh, I moved to Palm Springs. And in Palm Springs, the, the weirdness just started to amplify. And I had, I had gotten into the tarot and uh, of somebody who I had met had had exposed me to tarot and loaned me a deck of cards and said, "Hey, take a look at these." There, you know, uh, and I'd started to see that there was some truth there, and there was something there I didn't quite understand, and uh, but I was still keeping it out at arm's length and really wasn't pulling this stuff in and really trying to understand it. Uh, so, as I was living in Palm Springs. Uh, building a house, and one day across, from across town, I saw, I saw a cloud of smoke on the other side of town, and I remember making comments to a couple of the guys that were working with me. I said, "Wow, somebody looks like somebody's house burnt down over there." Well, a couple hours later, my my wife at the time showed up at the job site, uh, tears streaming down her face, and sure enough. It had been my house. My house had burnt completely to the ground, and I'd lost everything. Well, I went home to went to the house, and I I walked around the the burned out debris. I mean, it wasn't even a shell anymore. I mean, it was burnt to the ground. And I walked around that place, and I ended up falling to my knees in the center of this place, 
and I was crying and that was the day that I asked, what the hell is going on? Because, you know, the, the, the strange synchronicities and anomalies that had been increasing over the, the previous couple of years had, had really be, had intensified to the point where I had to know. I needed to know. I asked the question and I, it wasn't getting the answers here. So I was like, what the hell is going on? So, what did I do? First thing I needed to do, uh, the first thing I did was, was uh, okay, so in our world, the way things are set up, we have this religious structure that are supposed to be able to, uh, that, that are supposedly the ones that commune with God. They, they talk to the angels, they talk to God, and this is all uh, teachings and, and, and such that have been passed down and uh, divined from a holy or divine uh, source. So I decided to go into the Bible and I picked up the Bible and I read it from cover to cover. I was, we had, we had gotten some help from some local, the local Red Cross and got set up into a, an apartment complex. And, uh, this is where I was doing this at. And, and I was just a few weeks from, about a month from having to report to jail at this point. And while reading the Bible, I, I was still just uh, when I started reading the Bible, boy, the synchronicities intensified. I mean, I would read something out of the Bible, and and it was like a metaphor of life that was reflecting back at me. And I was starting my 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 inner hearing, my uh, heart hearing, was really becoming active, and I was starting to sense and see and hear different messages that were being directed at me. Uh, one day I had been, I had been praying and I was, when I, as I was reading this book, I was putting 110% faith into it. I was really, really putting my energy and my faith into believing this book because, it, and it was self-supporting. This thing was being self-supporting as I was putting that faith into it and reading it. It was manifesting in the world around me. And the messages I was beginning to get is, is Tom, you are special. You are, a, you are my son. I love you. I am the, the God of, of, I am your God and I love you and I support you and I, I will never let you down. And these were all good things, and I was, I was all open to this. I wanted that God to be real. I wanted to, there to be a reason and a purpose behind everything that had happened. So, what happened one day as I was, I, I had been uh, in turmoil, and, and I had kneeled at the side of the bed, and I prayed to God, tears streaming down my face. I prayed to God for some kind of understanding. I wanted to know what was going on and I wanted to know, I wanted to understand. And at this point I'm going to tell you, since from the time that I had that dream when I was five years old, up until this point, I don't ever, I never recalled a single dream at night. I never recalled one dream in 24 years. And uh, so I was on my knees at the side of the bed, cried, crying, prayed. Then I laid down on the bed and I cried myself to sleep. I had a dream. And that in itself, that, the fact that I remembered it was shocking enough. That was uh, anomalous enough for me at that point. Now inside this dream, I was in my house and it was dark outside and I I was I pulled down the top of the curtain to look out over the top of the curtain 
and I could see other houses and other buildings uh, uh, but the, that had lights on in them and stuff. And, and so I knew I wasn't completely alone here, but I was in my house and I saw, I saw Mike Deacon, who was a, a guy that I'd known in second grade when I was growing up. Uh, and he was walking up the sidewalk to the front door and I got excited. I was happy. I was like, all right, my friend Mike's coming. And so I went outside to greet him. And I went out and said, hey, Mike, how you doing? Oh, man, come on in my house. Let's talk and catch up and all this stuff. So we turned around and walked to the back to the front door. And as I got to the door, I reached out and grabbed the knob and it was locked. I was like, oh, don't worry, Mike. We'll go around back and we'll, I'll let you in through the back door. So we go around back to, to the back of the house and, oops, the back door was locked too. Don't worry, Mike, I'll go through the second story window and let you in. So the scene cut away, you know, scenes cut away in a dream. It was kind of, you know, they just kind of flashed to the next scene. Next scene, I'm, I'm floating near the ceiling, a big vaulted ceiling in my kitchen. And I'm floating near the ceiling as Mike's standing just inside the door. And he's, he looks around and, and then he finally sees me up there floating near the ceiling and looks up at me. And absolute terror fills his face. And he's just completely terrified and he starts running. And I'm completely puzzled at why he's ter why he's afraid, he's, he, why he's running from me. Why are you, I mean, what's going on, Mike? So I start chasing him, through, chasing him through my house. And I chase him for a while and I finally get him cornered in a room. He's, he's backed into a corner and he has a, a statue of Mother Mary in his hands. And he's holding it out like a crucifix uh, to a vampire trying to ward me off with the statue of Mary. And he said, I, I, I swore I'd never speak of this again. You, 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 you're the devil. And I reached out with my hands and put my hands around his and the statue. And I said, no, I love. And I woke up. Now, 24 years of no dreams and uh, with everything that had been going on with the, with me reading the Bible and really asking a question and really looking and trying to find the answers to have a, this to be the first dream after that long, uh, it had a lot of impact on me. It really made me, me think, oh my God, I'm the devil. Uh, Mike Deacon thinks I'm the devil. And, uh, you know, I, I started looking at this and I, I saw it. Initially, I saw it as, okay, uh, Mike Deacon, the deacon kind of uh, pointed me towards the organized religion, the church, uh, sees me as the devil because they don't understand that I love. They don't understand, they see me for something other than I am. Or, or they, acu they're acu acu they accuse me uh, without justification. So... 24 years and boom, here's this dream. So I start really at that point after that dream, I really started going into prayer and asking God for answers, asking to understand what was really going on. And mind you, I'm still, uh, the Bible is still my primary source for uh, information for trying to sort out what was really going on. These things that were above and beyond the third dimensional that were happening to me had to have an explanation. They just had to have an explanation. And the Bible seemed at this point, that really truly seemed to be guiding me and talking to me. Now, I really started asking these questions and, and in the prayers and meditations that I was doing, I was beginning to receive clear messages. And I was being told that I was the son. You are my son. And I would ask questions like, what do you mean I'm your son? You are my beloved son. And I, I started putting things together. You mean, 
What do you mean your beloved son? I mean, I, I, I had a lot of turmoil up here. Things were, were really starting to get confused here. And I didn't want to go here, but it, the, the messages I kept receiving, plus not just the internal messages that were happening, it was the synchronicities that were happening around th these questions also. Uh, that were were supporting and giving confirmation for uh, the questions that I was asking and the answers I was receiving. So what happened is I, I began I began to to really uh, I, I started reading deeper. I read more the Bible. I read uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, I read, uh, I mean, it was read, read, anything I could get my hands on. And as uh, things continued to develop there, I started getting, I, as I re received more of these messages, and they kept confirming for me, and, and supporting all these things in my head, I started forming what, what is known as the Messiah Complex. <clears throat> where I was, I was truly beginning to believe that I was the returned uh, son of God, the prophesied son of God, the Jesus Christ. You know, uh, this one of things where uh, I I ask questions like, "What do you mean? Uh, 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 what do you mean return on a cloud? Uh, is this a clouded mind or one that all all can see?" And I would get the confirmation, it's a clouded mind. And, and look at yourself, Tom. This is what's happened to you. You have come back and your mind has been clouded. You were clouded, number one, in your dreams for 24 years. They were completely clouded out. You didn't see your dreams. Uh, you were confused, that haze of confusion, the, the clouded mind. So... I was truly beginning to, I was, I was really believing this. Uh, I would do things like I would, I would hike up into the Coachella mountains, if you want to call them mountains, but uh, the Coachella Valley is, is the valley that Palm Springs is in. And I would hike up into these mountains and uh, sit up there and meditate and pray and try and, and talk to God. And God would talk to me. And it would continue, it continually confirmed, every, every, whenever that question was asked, the confirmation was given in, in some form or fashion. And like I said, this wasn't just the internal confirmations that I was getting that I was the Son of God. It was an external force too. Uh, so, it really began to seat and sink in very deeply. And it seemed like the more, uh, the deeper that I believed this, the Deep, deeper I, I felt the truth of this, that the more amazing the synchronicities were, the more amazing the magic was around me. Uh, now that I had quite a few different experiences through this time that I could go into, but I don't have time to do all those right now, but uh, at some later date maybe I, I'll go into some of these things. Um, I truly saw myself as that Son of God returned from being hung on the cross. I mean, uh, things like I have, I, have, I have scars on my wrists, both wrists, in the same place, and I have scars on my feet from stepping on nails. Actually, I was a carpenter for a long time, but I have scars on both my feet from stepping on nails. I have scars on both my wrists. Uh, uh, the, I, when I was 18, I was stabbed in the back, so, uh, well, kind of, right under my shoulder blade on the side so that's the the wound from the spear and all these things all these different things and and stuff like this that that kept adding up and pointing and confirming yes tom you are the son you have returned so uh the the, the time to report to jail to do my i was sentenced at the point at this point i was sentenced to five months in county jail at san Bernardino county in southern california and as I, as I reported to jail, I was in the full-blown uh, Messiah complex. I knew 
I was son, the Son of God. I knew I was Jesus Christ, and there was no doubt in my mind. I had wiped the doubt out of my mind. Now, here's a, this is an overhead view of San Bernardino County Jail. And it's a minimum security facility with ma minimum and maximum, through maximum security facility. Now I need to explain this to you to let you understand the process that I went through and, and what really happened there. Now, <clears throat> I carried my Bible everywhere. I mean, it was, it was, I spoke and I shared and I know I had some serious impact on a lot of people there because I was, I had completely read the Bible. I mean, completely from cover to cover, uh, once completely, and I was on. I began reading it for the second time, and and as I as I was, as I was, interacting with people there at the jail, I was able to, to actually talk about the way God loves them and the way, uh, the the the, sacrifice that was done, and uh, you know I was able to preach and share the word, you know the word of God. And I had some, uh, oh my God, the, the anomalies, the synchronicities, the, the miracles, the flat out miracles that were happening were, were absolutely amazing. The magic was there and, it could, and it's mainly due because I knew I was a son of God. Now, right, right here there's this big, it was a walking track that everybody walked around and round on at, at the jail. I was in this minimum security facility right here. And I was actually, my, my bed was right there. Uh, so, uh, and I had been in here for two weeks at this point. And I was walking around this track with two guys and talking about God and how God loved them. And, and uh, uh, I don't remember, all of the conversation that I was having with them, but I was, I was really getting through with these to these guys, and the energy that I was putting out, the, the, uh, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall and witnessed what I looked like at that point because there was some, some absolute, some truly amazing energy flowing through me at that point. Now, the. One day, two weeks, I'd been there for two weeks, and I was walking around with these two guys, and I was talking about the love of God, and the bell rang. Uh, the bell rang to go back inside. You know, uh, exercise period or whatever it was, rec period was over, and it was time to go back into the, into the dormitories. And right after the bell rang, to finish the conversation with these two guys, I told, I, I, I remember saying, and always remember that God loves you. And as soon as I finished saying that, this mylar balloon, a heart-shaped balloon with the word love on it, drops out of the sky 10 feet in front of us. <laughs> now, you can imagine what these two guys thought. These two guys, their jaws dropped open. They were just, they looked at me and looked at this balloon and, and they were just like, ugh. Wow. So, during all this time, you have to understand, all these, these two weeks I'm praying, and I'm getting messages, confirmations, and I'm talking to, uh, uh, I'm having a, a sort of dialogue that was, was uh, I have to say hit and miss, because as I was, I would ask a question, and the answer I would receive was, was not always clear, but I, I would work on filling in the answer to make it understandable to myself. And, uh, and I'd work through things, uh, break the, 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 the dialogue down and, and try to con get confirmation on different aspects and points of this conversation. And it was still, it was still very, very uh, supporting of the uh, whole Messiah complex thing, the whole you are my son and, and uh, you are the returned Messiah. So I'm also, during this time, I'm getting messages that uh, 
you don't belong here. You are not supposed to be in this jail. And it's time for you. It's, it's coming time for you to leave, Tom. Well, my job in this minimum security jail was to work. I worked in the laundry as a sewer. So I sewed and mended uniforms and, and sewed stuff, you know, on the sewing machines. And which there's your, there's your metaphor there. I was sewing, you know, I was sewing the seeds or, or I was mending their clothes. You know, I was mending their souls. Uh, and, and all these things came to my, were, were in my consciousness as I was doing these things. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm sewing. I'm so, what does sewing mean? You know, uh, all these things would pop into my head and, and I was aware of these synchronicities and aware of these things happening. So, so the day after this, the balloon fell, the day after uh, I'm in the laundry and uh, the night before and all morning and, and the, as I was sitting there sewing, I kept getting the messages, it's time to leave, Tom, you need to get up and leave, you need to walk out, you walk out, we are, we will protect you and we will guide you through and we will, we will, we will help you leave this place, you need to, your work, you need to leave to do your work. And I'm like, uh, you got to be kidding me, you know, I can't leave here, how am I supposed to do this and stuff, we will protect you, Tom, we will guide you. So finally, I was uh, after after this became so intense. The 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 messages coming in were so intense that that, and I couldn't block this stuff out. It was it was so intense that it was. Uh, I I felt as I had no option. I I had to do this. I had to do it. I had to follow what I, I, as I was being guided. So I finally said, okay, God, I'm putting my life in your hands. You guide me. I will follow. So I stood up and, and here I am. At, this is the laundry building here. And the door to go in is right here in this corner. And I, the, my sewing machine was right over in this corner. And so I stood up in this thing and I walked towards the door and there's a desk at the door with a, a guard, one of the guards, the guard that watched the people working in the laundry. And I stood up and I walked over to the door and I walked past this guard sitting at the desk and he never looked up. Not one, didn't look, just did not look up at me. And I walked out of the door. I mean, nobody's outside at all. I mean, everybody is indoors doing whatever, you know, their, their jobs during the day or, you know, whatever they were doing. I, nobody is outside at all. And so I walk out, I walk out of the laundry and I start walking this way. The main gate's over here, main gate's over here. And I start walking down and this is an admin building right here. This is the lunchroom here, the, the cafeteria. And this is an admin building right here. And as I came up to this building, this woman came walking out of the building and she walked up right next to me and, and right past me. And she had a patch over one eye. And the message I got is, she can't see you, Tom. Look, she can't see you. We are protecting you. We are guiding you. She can't see you. And sure enough, she never looked up at me, never glanced at me, nothing. And I was watching her as she was coming up. She never even glanced at me. And so I'm feeling, I felt a little bit more confidence with that. So I'm, I'm continuing on. I'm, and at this point, the mind starts working and I'm going, oh my God, I'm going to, if I mean, I'm, am I going to get in trouble, blah, blah, blah. Are you guys going to protect me? And and but the the wheels were starting to the to turn and and I was starting to doubt what I was doing. So, anyways, I, I get across here and I start walking towards the main gate. And the way jails work, they have two gates. One gate's only open at one time at at a time. They never will open two gates at the same time. Security thing. Well, as I'm walking up to the exterior, the inside gate. There was a van that was pulling onto the property and, and he was at the outside gate. And as I was walking up, 
they opened up the outside gate and immediately opened up the inside gate. So both gates are open at the same time. And I walked through those gates without slowing down, without speeding up. I didn't change my pace. I didn't stop. I didn't do it. I just kept walking at my steady pace. And I walked right through both gates. As I was walking through those two gates, my mind started going like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm running, I'm walking out of jail. I'm escaping from jail. Oh geez, what, a, oh crap, I'm go, what am I going to get in trouble? You know, the, the mind started going, you know. And sure enough, as soon as I get outside the, the exterior gate, and, and by the way, there's like 30 people standing in line waiting to go in and visit people at the jail. And as as I get outside the gate, a guard comes running out of the out of the guard shack. You know, and he does the the whole cop thing. You know, freeze on the ground, all this stuff. And so, you know, I did absolutely no resistance from me. Uh, I get on the ground, and they cuff me and take me in and put me in a in a holding cell. And I was in there for a few minutes, and the the guard that did a that cuffed me and brought me in. I guess he had to fill out a report. And uh, so he comes in and, and starts questioning me. He said, he asked me what, what was going on. Why in the hell? Are, what? Are you crazy? Are you walking out the main gate of the jail? And so here I am thinking, oh, geez, if I tell them I think I'm Jesus Christ, they're going to send me into a padded room. They're, you know, gonna, I'm, they don't want them to think I'm crazy and all these things. So so I denied what was really going on. I said, uh, oh, I was lonely. I needed to go see, you know, my wife and cute new baby and, and all these things. And, and so he does his report and then they, they put me in, in the hole, which is, I, uh, this is isolation from hell. I mean, it's a little tiny four foot by eight foot cell with a concrete slab for a bed and a stainless steel toilet. And I'm in this little room for a couple of days, and and my mind is just wow. I went to some very interesting places with my consciousness in that in that little cell. Uh, but he's in there for a couple of days, and then the uh, one of the, the the sergeant of the guard or whatever that he's called there uh, uh, called me out into another room to do another interview, and and again they asked me. You know what? What were you doing walking out of jail? And, and uh, so I, I didn't. Again, I didn't want to go. I'm Jesus Christ. I'm the, the Messiah or anything like that. I didn't want it. I didn't want that padded cell. So, uh, so I denied it a sec. I denied what was really going on a second time. And uh, so, they put me back in this in the 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 hall and. And a couple more days goes by, and uh, the San Bernardino County uh, Jail psychologist comes in to interview me. And again, I, I gave her the same story. So I denied what you know what was really going on in here. You know, I denied it a third time. And uh, as soon as I was done with that one, I guess they deemed that I wasn't a danger to myself or to any other inmates, and uh, put me out in. Uh, what they call the ISO block, isolation block. And uh, what that is, is, it was eight cells that were back to back with solid walls in between but open bars on the face of the cell. So you can talk to the guys or hear the guys in the cells next to you, but you can't see anybody. And I, uh, I get in this cell and not 10, 10 15 minutes goes by when a, a guy a couple of cells down uh, crows. He, er, 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 he, he, his name was Rooster. He was uh, the uh, his nickname was Rooster. So, what happened was I denied three times before the rooster crowed. <laughs> now I hope some of you 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 probably all know this story about uh, uh, Peter and and how he denied three times before the rooster crowed, and that's that's what Jesus had told him out of the book. So. It was, it was actually pretty amazing, and this actually, this whole thing reinforced that Messiah complex. It reinforced it within me, and, and I was believing deeper, and, and, uh, but I, I still I couldn't understand why it had taken me through this process of, 
of you know the pain that I was feeling. You know the 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 uh, you know, I was not having a good time. Trust me. And but it was this this did reinforce it. It seemed it seemed to reinforce the Messiah complex. So. I was trying to make sense of what, what had this whole thing, how this had all transpired. I mean, trying to make sense of, of why this spirit, and why the angels, or why God had, had, had put me in this position where I'd, I'd walked out of jail, where now, uh, uh, you know, I was in maximum security now with a red wristband on as an escape risk. Uh, you know, I was really trying to understand uh, what was going on and there was something else that was starting to happen that was making me question what had happened you know uh, they told me that I was going to walk through there and that I would go I would be free that so I I had to question what I perceived that it wasn't right what they told me wasn't right. So I was starting to see through uh, the, the, uh, I was starting to see through the illusion that was being cast in front of me and see that it wasn't true, that there wasn't, that there's something there that wasn't quite right. And the, second time through the Bible began then, I mean, the, in earnest. Well, I mean, I had nothing but time on my hands. I'm in maximum security. There's no jobs to do. There's no, you know, get to go outside for half the day and walk around the track or play basketball or whatever. You know, there's none of those things happening in maximum security. You're, you're, you sit around, you know, you do nothing. Uh, so, time to read the Bible the second time. And uh, so I began reading and uh, starting, started really trying to re reflect on what had happened and reflect on, on everything that had transpired. And I began questioning that whole Messiah complex thing. It must, it, you know, am I truly the Son of God? Am I truly this Messiah that everybody you know, talks about? Now, the second time through the Bible, I, I was looking at it from a little bit different perspective this time, and I was reading it trying to, to figure out, you know, that there was something that wasn't right here. And I was really trying to figure it out. And this is a, a passage that is, is out of the book of John. It's John 14.6 that, that, that really sunk in and got started to get through to me. It says, no one comes to the Father but through me. Now, I started breaking that down. I broke that down in my, I started breaking it down in my mind. Uh, now, I asked the question, what is it to go through something? <clears throat> and when I read this, I had the picture, a, a mental picture that popped into my, my brain, that, into my mind, of a door. And I thought about that, and I thought about what it means to go through a door. Uh, what happens when you go through a door? When you go through a door, uh, you're into a new area, and everything on the, that was before is in the other, on the other side of the door. And I looked at this and said, no man, no one comes to the Father but through the Son, or through me. So that told me that, going through that religious process, becoming that Messiah complex for myself, was a process for, for me to, well, ultimately become a, I understood that it to be a process for me to, that, to go through to actually understand or go to the Father, to understand what God is, to understand that, that it's, it's the grandness, the, the majesty, the, the, uh, the the completeness now this was a huge breakthrough for me absolute huge breakthrough through for me because up to this point i was still uh 
I was still stuck in that Messiah complex, and I, I didn't, I was, it was, I was starting to feel like a, a, a cornered animal, you know, which way do I go, which way do I go, and it, my mind was, was really starting to lose it. Uh, and there were quite a few times during this period that I questioned my own sanity. I seriously questioned my own sanity. I uh, wasn't sure whether or not my mind was going to make it through that. Now, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, I came to that point where I, I saw that going through the door, I went through that experience of Christianity. And, and as I was able to, to really absorb what had happened there and, and looking back at all these different events and trying to understand all the miracles that had happened, all that magic that had happened that was still undeniable. I could not deny that that balloon fell out of the sky. I could not deny the, the, the bones in the clouds. I, I, I could not deny so many different things that had happened, so many synchronicities and miracles and and conversations with, a, with physical beings from other realms. I could not deny those things. They happened. And bringing started, things started coming together. My understanding of what transpired starting to come together. So that was a huge breakthrough that second time through on the Bible. I started to understand the illusion of life. I started to understand how, how things aren't really the way they appear. The, the true uh, essence of life is not the way it appears in the third dimensional realm. I mean, this, this, may, this may look like a, a TV and a TV stand, but the truth behind it is it's an empty space. It's 99.9999% empty space. So there's a certain element of illusion there that, that is not truth, that is not true on a, uh, on a level that is above and beyond the third dimension. Now, as I was going over all the things that I'd gone through and, and reprocessing these events and these experiences, I started to put together the fact that I put 110% of faith into that book. I'd put 110% of, of belief into what was happening, of me being that Messiah. I, was, I really believed that. And I was seeing, and especially the, the, the event, like the, 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 the whole escape process, when I walked through the jail, the gates of the jail, everything surrounding that, I started to really understand how I was projecting that, how my belief and my faith had projected that into my world, into my experience. It, that the world, uh, the, everything around me was reflecting what, what I truly believed within myself. Uh, you know, I was and I still, and still, and we all do it to this day. Manifest our own reality. We create that reality. Boy, more questions, more questions. How? How do we create that reality? How does this stuff work? I don't understand. I what? I'm not able to cut, wrap my head around all this stuff. So. I've been working for a lot of years, truly trying to understand everything that happened and everything that mani the the way manifestation works and the way the reflections happen and how how uh, oh just all of it. I mean, there's 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 so many different paths to take to uh, you know really trying to to sort out. A uh, pretty confused mind. Uh, my, I mean, as I was snapping out of this Messiah complex, it wasn't an easy process to to come back to uh, some place where I had my feet solid on the ground once again. Um, and uh, it was a it was a it was a tough road road to hoe. 
uh, trying to trying to uh, I guess the the biggest the biggest part of it was trying to understand how uh, this stuff was was happening in the world around me how I was projecting these things my faith what was that key element was it just my belief and my faith or was it something that I knew and seeing I began to really see that uh, what we we learn and what we are we, what we're programmed with as we're growing up is what is going to manifest that reality for us around, uh, in the world around us and I started seeing people that were being led uh, with absolutely no concern for anything besides uh, what they'd been shown, what they'd been taught. Had no, in, no individual questions for themselves, no real questions that, re that really meant a whole lot. And that's, that's my humble opinion, but uh, yeah, they've, uh, I saw the herd, the sheeple, as, as this shows. I saw the sheeple. And uh, and it was it was it was quite disturbing actually watching watching them uh, and and breaking out of this for myself. So I realized at this point it began I began to understand that I too had been a victim of this programming that my consciousness and the way I thought and what the way I saw the world was also. Uh, a victim of the programming, and I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't completely. Uh, I wasn't completely cognit, uh, cognizant of all of the different aspects that were happening within me at this point. Uh, but I was real. I was starting to understand that it was. It was something uh, that was deep within my own personal psychology that that. Uh, had to be erased. You know, you got to break these things. You got to look at things with a different set of eyes, Tom. So, and again, and looking out around me, I const I saw, I began, began to become aware of the constant reinforcement of the programming, uh, the, where environment was constantly trying to, to funnel people back into that narrow path or the, that their own personal paths. Uh, that that kept those questions out of the way. Uh, the cognitive dissonance that was abound within everybody. Uh, they uh, they they don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it, and they don't want to speak it, because what they would have to see, hear, or speak is too disturbing to the norm. It's uncomfortable. It's been labeled. Uh, uh, you know the woo-woo. It's been labeled uh, uh, and ridiculed throughout history. Uh, so I was becoming aware of that that herd mentality of of how uh, of how it was being done to us. How that that mass media that uh, all our media areas were all trying to funnel us back into into that that uh, controllable uh, controllable form uh, religion was created to control the masses remember earlier I, earlier I said that that was my patent answer whenever anything above and beyond the third dimension was mentioned you know the anything in, along religious term, terms or spiritual terms it was uh, always uh, religion was created to control the masses, and I, I I didn't know how true how true that statement was. So I went down a lot of really crazy paths as I was I was beginning my research, and uh, I learned that discernment was uh, a huge element in in being able to do this and. Uh, gain my sanity back back at the same time because I was not balanced. I was not balanced. So discernment's a, two, a term used to describe the activity of determining the value and quality of a certain subject or event. 
Typically, it is used to describe the, acti the activity of going past the mere perception of something to making detailed judgments about that thing. So, discernment is huge uh, in all of, especially when you're going into things that resonate in the heart, things that uh, of the spiritual or religious nature. Uh, in our environment right now, uh, if you get on the internet and start looking, there is so much crap out there. There's so much out there that will will uh, <clears throat> take you down some dead ends and uh, try to suck every dime you've got in your pocket out of you. Uh, so, it's a huge tool to have in your bag. <clears throat> if you don't have discernment, then um, you're Sorry, you're going to have a rough time. Now, my personal investigations took me down a lot of paths. And uh, I've got a bit more, quite a bit more that I, I will be talking about in another video. And, uh, but right now, uh, I think I need to, to wrap this up a little bit and try to um, put one of the things that I... I found through this experience for myself in my personal journey. The reflections of life. Uh, one of the biggest visions that I've, I had through uh, this whole experience and after I, and, and this is not that long ago that I was able to actually really bring this into a deeper level of understanding, is seeing and understanding that we are all uh, individuated, that those individuated units of consciousness, we are all points of, of life existing in common within this third dimensional realm. But each one of us, from our own perspective, is the center of our own universe. And everything around us is reflecting our consciousness back to us. Now, each one of us is a mirror for those around us. Each one of us is a projector uh, on those mirrors and have that life reflected back to us. I saw and, and experienced that on a very great level. And if there's one thing that I can share with anybody and everybody that watches this, and one truth that I do know. Now, I'm not asking you to believe what I believe or, or anything like that. You have to do this for yourself. You have, to, you have to understand this for yourself and you have to learn this for yourself. Or it won't, you can't take somebody else's truth as your truth without that experience. But one thing I know for myself is that I do project out into the world around me. I do project my consciousness out there and it reflects in experience, in metaphor, in so many different subtle and varied ways. Uh, I don't always understand that reflection. I don't always uh, get a direct link to what my consciousness is doing and, and why it's reflected in that way. But I know and, and every time I've really, I've taken a certain subject or a certain situation and I've, I've really looked at it and gone inside myself with it and tried to puzzle it out. I found uh, in some form or fashion or metaphor or, or symbol or whatever, there's always been something uh, that's shown me that it, it, yes, it is a reflection. Yes, it is something that I, I was part of projecting out into the world. And, and understanding that each one of us is that center point of our own universe and coexisting on this planet, the complexity the, the complexity and amaze, oh my God, the amazing synchronicity and, and meshing of all these different gears together to make something that is uh, even 
something that we can exist in is uh, staggering to say the least that, that it is able to do it and still reflect. So anyways, life is a reflection guys. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. And this reflection is uh, uh, quite amazing when you really start to understand it and you start to see it and you start to experience it on a conscious level. So, for now, uh, I want to thank you for watching and I hope that what I've shared here has uh, some meaning for you or, you know, something guys. I mean, uh, I haven't really, I've only told this story to a handful of people and uh, I am, I am very grateful and uh, uh, amazed in, on some at some times that I came through this and uh, have been able to uh, uh, regain my footing on this planet and uh, a little bit more stability and, and a deeper understanding of who and what we are. And, uh, anyways, uh, namaste, love you guys, and uh, I will be talking again. Bye now.